He says, hi, all thanks for the continued quality content. My question relates to achieving the best results from an individual workout. Is it more beneficial to complete an entire workout at 95% or fail in the intervals at a hundred percent stated more plainly? Is it more beneficial to complete the workout at a lower intensity or will failing at a higher intensity derive similar results? Uh, the answer to this one is it depends. <laughs> so <laughs> we can just leave it there. We can actually get into a little bit more. Um, we actually have quite a lot of notes on this one. I think that we'll probably end up talking about how we adjust when things aren't right, but then we'll also talk about the different, you know, kind of like, because once again, it depends the rules I say loosely here that we use individually on, on that sort of a thing. I, I think probably the best, the first thing to cover is like, it depends on the workout. If it's a key workout, then I'm much more likely to try to con to complete that workout at hundred percent. If it's a rough day, like, so that's the assumption it's a rough day and you're not able to perform like you should be able to perform, whether it's lack of sleep, whether it's any number of different things that you're facing. So if it's like a key workout, what I mean by that is if I'm doing a short power build and that one really focuses on those three to five minute VO2 efforts, and throughout the week, I might have one or two workouts that really focus on that sort of intensity and duration, but then my other workouts that I'm facing probably aren't going to, they're going to be lower intensity, longer efforts, that sort of a thing. So if it's the key workouts for that week, and it's easy to recognize which ones those are, then I'm much more likely to try to push those to hundred percent compliance. Like I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to the bitter end sort of a thing. Um, and also if it's like higher intensity, then the accuracy matters more. And the reason that's the case is because when you talk about energy systems that you're utilizing as, and really it kind of coincides with the, the power zones that you have as they go higher in intensity, they get smaller, the windows become smaller. And that's because the bandwidth to bring about the specific changes that you want in your body in that energy system, it just operates within a narrower range and it gets narrower and narrower as it goes up. So as a result, like you can turn down a sweet spot workout and you, you kind of have more bandwidth than if you're doing a VO2 workout, turning it down when you do a VO2 workout can easily pop you into threshold territory. And as a result, you'll be building something that's going to be quite different in terms of what's actually intended for the workout. So those are kind of like how I weigh how much, like how much grit I'm going to have that day, so to speak, like how hard I'm going to hold on to what I'm supposed to hold on to. And on other days I'll, I'll be okay, depending on the workout with just, you know, making those adjustments and going through, uh, Pete, how about, how about you? Yeah, this one was really funny when we were talking about it because you kind of, uh, gleaned some insight into everybody's psychology a little more. Yeah. And, yeah. and I would say that's something you should definitely know about yourself as an athlete, like, uh, try to set yourself up for success, uh, no matter what that is. And so for me, we realized that I. I just hate failing workouts. I can't stand it. It drives me up the wall. So, and it, it derails my training. It makes me less excited about the following workout. There's, it, there's kind of, um, more down the pipeline. If I fail a workout that is going to be against me than if I, uh, do a slightly, uh, easier workout and succeed. So the way I've, the way I've kind of done this is two ways. Um, if I'm really feeling awful and I'm going into like a, a key workout, um, I'll turn it, I'll start with it turned down and I'll try to only do 5%. Um, because kind of, if you can make it through the first one, uh, we've all been there where once you make it through the first one, the rest aren't that bad. Um, and so <laughs> that's just you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, so this is if Pete I, logic at work. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is real Pete logic. So yeah. <laughs> what I would rather do is turn down the first interval than turn down the last interval because that's easier on my psychology. So uh, yep. I would turn, I'll turn down the first one and then bump it up a couple percent if I still feel really bad um, and try the second set or the second block or whatever. And if I'm still feeling really bad and unhappy, I'll probably call it then. I won't even, I'll just say, I'm not ready for this today. I, it's not something I should do. I'm not going to beat my head against the wall. And the next workout, I'll put more grit into, and I'm going to pass the next workout no matter what. Um, but the, the other half or the other side of this coin is I started doing less workouts per week. Um, and I started doing it the year I got faster or more competitive. I started doing less workouts per week, but more key workouts per, or 
I, I just had three key workouts I had to nail every single week. And if you're kind of rested and motivated and there's only three workouts per week, it's easier for me to grit up and uh, start mm -hmm. just say, hey, this is it. I get a rest day tomorrow. I can really lay it all out there. Um, I have to finish strong and then I get to wait till Thursday um, and do it again. And then I do it again on Saturday and everything in between that is leading into let's maximize our time that we're spending on the bike. Um, and so my compliance rate went up and I was able to do harder workouts because I was slightly more rested and I wasn't failing um, or kind of biting off too much. Um, and I, I was still doing pretty large chunks of TSS. Well, for me, like, I think it was like six or 700, but only doing that in three workouts a week and probably one easy spin. Um, it made it so that I really was there to do some work on those days and I got much faster and my compliance rate went up. Um, and it was way easier for me to deal with mentally. And so I still kind of adhered to that. I do three workouts a week that I care about, and I'm not going to compromise those in any way, uh, by doing extra stuff, uh, unless it's mountain biking, which doesn't compromise anything. Yeah, actually um, mountain biking TSS doesn't exist, right? Yeah. We can just convince good. ourselves of that. So we can if just you do don't have a power more. meter on it. It's fine. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> Smart thinking, uh, Pete. <laughs> so, so that's, that's the way that I've learned to deal with the way I like to do workouts is not fail. And I just do less higher compliance and make sure I'm really motivated. And, um, if they're hard, I look forward to uh, a hard workout. I look forward to more and I'm excited about accomplishing. And then it kind of builds snowballs. And then the next workout I'm excited and then I can accomplish it. And then it snowballs. So that's the yeah. way I I've, I've learned to deal with my training psychology. <laughs> this is the, that brings up and reinforces like a different point to this question, but I think a lot of athletes feel the pressure to do more and more volume all the time, but an athlete at Pete's level has found value in doing less because that allows him to hit it with more precision and consistency is with their, tr with training is the greatest influence that we see, uh, across like the large pool of athlete data that we have and making somebody faster. If you're consistent, you get faster. Like that is across the board. That is a rule that actually proves out to be very effective, <clears throat> but it's hard to be consistent when you have too much work on your plate because it ends up pulling from everything. And then it makes those key workouts really hard to do. So kudos Pete on finding what works and probably swallowing pride. I assume along with that to like do less because a lot of the time pride is involved in that, that decision. I, so I did a lot of years of riding too much. Um, and mm -hmm. it wasn't helpful. I just didn't know. I, I just rode more because that's what you assume. If you're doing more of it, it has to be better. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it took a couple of years of doing that incorrectly before I realized that I was selling myself short. Yeah, no doubt. Ivy, how about you? Uh, what do you, what do you do for, for this, the adjustments on bad days? <laughs> yeah. Well, Pete and I are different people. Uh, <laughs> I love to fail workouts. <laughs> uh, but yeah, where, where Pete tries to like take some intensity off if he's not feeling great, um, my approach is different. I still try to hit that first uh, interval at 100% intensity. Yeah, <laughs> just, <laughs> just do it. Uh, and because I think that if it means that I can't, you know, I should interpret it as a signal that it's um, time to step back and that self care and some rest will be more beneficial for me in the long run um, than doing an effort that isn't 100% there. Um, and that totally varies like athlete to athlete um, because the reason why you fail a workout can vary greatly. Um, so it's important, um, I think, to listen to your body and apply some introspective thought on what could be causing you to not meet your mark. Um, mm -hmm. So I think Pete mentioned like a Venn diagram or an astrology chart or crystals. Is, I don't know, some <laughs> process you go through to decide like what it is um, that, you know, could be bringing you down. So if it's something like sleep or nutrition or stress causing me to fail, I know that pushing through is almost always going to be more harmful for me in the scope of a training block than just calling it. Um, and there's a lot of merit for me in just like the act of getting on the bike, you know, there's still like merit in that ride, even if I do end up failing and having to bail on intervals. Um, so yeah, if I've done everything right and checked all those 
boxes to prepare myself for the workout, like fueling and sleeping well and rest and everything, then it might be one of those instances where I should push through, um, and mm. just give her. Yes. That, that, the long-term perspective of the training block is super important. Like, where am I, where is this workout going to put me in three weeks? Like, particularly right now I'm going through sweet spot base, high volume. So that's a five week on one week off a uh, loading cycle of base training. Right. So that's like, that's, that's tough. And you really have to think week one when you're like, Oh, this is easy. I'm going to give it more gas on this interval than I should. And then you're like, hold on in four weeks. How are you going to feel? You know, like this is going to be really tough. That's it. So that's like a, a valuable uh, perspective to keep in mind with this and why it makes sense sometimes to step off the bike. I want to ask you, Ivy, how you deal with the thoughts that come in afterward. Cause they all come in our heads when we, when we get off that bike and we've in quotes failed that workout and we stopped that, then it becomes really hard for us to manage the psychology. A lot of the time as a type A athlete, because we feel like we failed. We feel like, gosh, like, what am I going to do now? So do you, have you found anything to help with coping with those sort of, uh, self frustrations that we feel? Uh, therapy. No, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, but I think that, you know, like myself five or six years ago, like would really beat myself up about that. Um, and that has to do so much with my approach to training and racing now and why I feel like I, I know that I'll have so much more longevity in the sport because, um, I'm much more forgiving and gentle to myself when things don't work out on the bike, like when I'm training and, you know, I do, I've, I, I can't just like designate time to just training anymore, you know, like with work and like every, all of our athletes can relate to that. Um, and so having a more whole, uh, life picture as well helps me cope with those failures a little bit better, like to step back and be like, like I've got a lot of other stuff going on and they're good things and it's okay to not be 100% on the bike all the time. Yeah. Keep it in perspective for sure. Uh, Alex, how about you? What do you, do you have rules? I assume that you have numerical rules for something like this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I take a bit of everybody's approach. Um, I will try to give you a view into my Venn diagram, astrology chart, crystal ball. <laughs> Crystals. <right there. laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of factors. So like where you are in the training plan, right? Whether or not it's a key workout. Um, I actually take Pete's approach in terms of how I approach workouts rather than executing only three a week. I still ride six days a week, but two or three of those are the workouts that I care about. So it kind of goes back to the old ideology, easy on your easy days, hard on your hard days. Like mm. if my endurance pace is 10 watts less than it's supposed to be, whatever. If my sweet spot is 10 watts lower than it's supposed to be, then it's something I care about. Mm. Um, and then beyond that, like you, Jonathan said, I within sweet spot, I have more wiggle room, right? To hit that energy system. Whereas VO2, it's very easy to convince yourself, like I'm only 15 Watts off, but it's threshold work. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding that, um, my general rule of thumb is within 5%, I'm good. Um, that I'll let you into how much of a nerd I am. That comes from power meter error, <laughs> how much I can justify <laughs> that my power meters lying to me. <laughs> um, that's kind of my, my line in the sand, I guess. But for example, yesterday I, <laughs> I drove 45 minutes to a really good ride spot, forgot my axis battery on my derailleur. So <laughs> drove back home and motivation was at an all time low. So the ride felt hard, but I was okay pushing through. Cause mentally I'm like, this is just coming from lack of motivation. Like I don't today, I don't want to turn the pedals. So I was okay pushing through that day knowing that today is going to be a rest day. So it's also like where that workout falls and what the expectation is. Like sometimes coming into an endurance ride, I expect to be tired. I expect it to be kind of a, a focus on the power meter all day kind of day. Whereas sometimes you come into an endurance ride at the beginning of a block and it's just like, you look down, you're like, oh, I should probably go easier. You know, the mm -hmm. RPE is completely different. Mm. But I think going to Ivy's point, if I decide or the numbers show me that I'm not hitting the workout that day. I've really tried to own decisions, not just within this, but across the board. Like if I decide on a quote unquote cheat meal, right. Or I decide to do something that I'm 
quote unquote, not supposed to do, I own that decision. So if I, if I decide that that workout's not for me, no matter what happens. And I've had times I got home and called my coach and he's like, yeah, you probably should have stuck it out. You know? <laughs> so it's like, those are the worst, but it's like, I made that decision with the information that I had at the time and stressing over it isn't going to change it. It's like, okay, now I'll move forward with the knowledge that I have and make a more informed decision next time. So I think mm. not beating yourself up is a big part of it. Yeah. The one workout, like, even though it's called a key workout, n not being perfect on that key workout still isn't going to throw everything off. Uh, what will throw everything off is if you get down on yourself and really frustrated and start to tell yourself that you're not the athlete that you are because you are an athlete, you're trying to train, you're doing those things. So you are an athlete, but all those things start to creep into our minds when we have workout failures. Uh, it's yeah. really frustrating, but there's ways that we can manage that and just understand. I, I really, I really like the decision ownership part. Like you own the decision and then you look at that objectively. So then next time you can make uh, more informed decisions. And then that's just, it just builds on itself. Um, yeah. And there's training tons of very Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say training is all directional, right? It comes back to that consistency piece. Like for Pete, mm -hmm. he was finding what made him consistent. And that's why he's succeeding with that. It's like, find a plan that you can stick to 95 to 99% of the time, right? It's like, if you're not pushing up against those limits, and I think that's why Ivy loves failing workouts is she knows she's pushing your limits. She's, she's right there. Right. And it's like, how do you know where those limits are? Unless you go over them a couple of times. It's like, if you're mm -hmm. comfortably completing workouts all the time, then I would challenge you to take a ramp test, right? Like mm -hmm. you kind of have to find where your limits are to really fulfill yourself as an athlete. Yeah. I would, I would say that no, no plan that's pushing an athlete to their potential will be free of failure points at some point. Like it's going to happen. That's, that's part of the training process. It needs to happen. Uh, if you're really, uh, moving forward. So yeah, it's, um, and there's so many things like Alex, I like that you mentioned like the different variables that come into, I think you too, Ivy, like if you're checking the boxes for recovery, nutrition, that sort of stuff, it's always really important to consider those when you are facing tough, uh, or like a, a tough workout. Like if you're not performing well and you're wondering why first calibrate your power meter, <laughs> and then number two, after that, it again. Uh, yeah, then calibrate <laughs> it again until you get repeat <laughs> values, just like, yeah inside into my brain. I calibrate until I get a repeat value. And then at that point I'm like, good sound calibration we can move forward. So, um, but calibrate your power meter. Then after that, then ask yourself and be like, okay, uh, what was my sleep? Like, what's my nutrition been like? What's that, you know? And then as a result, don't beat yourself up over that. Just use that to set your expectations for what you should be able to do. And then you can once again, learn from it because the next time you're likely going to say, Oh, I didn't eat enough. Or I, I waited way too long for my last meal to this workout. And as a result, I'm feeling super, you know, uh, depleted and, and, and hungry. And as a result, you know, it's, it's tougher. So if you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.